Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our study in the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis now, chapter 15. We're beginning chapter 15, and this is one of those chapters that's very, very important in terms of the, the covenant that God is going to make with Abraham. In chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, those earlier chapters, um, God has been making promises to Abraham or Abram and um, has been uh, making statements to him, has blessed him. And even with Melchizedek coming to him is another sign from God to him that, that Abram is, has been selected by God for a special purpose in his life and God has shown his sovereignty to him. And in chapter 15, uh, this is uh, another kind of hallmark chapter. When you take it with the initial promises that were made in chapter 12, what's going to happen here in chapter 15, and then what's going to happen in chapter 17, those three sections really define for us what we know to be uh, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God makes with Abraham that is uh, mentioned throughout the rest of Scripture, especially in the Gospel of Matthew when it talks about how Christ is the son of Abraham. When it says that he's the son of Abraham, it means that he is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and all the stipulations and details that are provided there. So we're going to be looking at these chapters as we look at chapter 15 and then eventually get to chapter 17. And it's going to tie all together with the promises that God has already made in chapter 12 and, and help us to understand um, what are the stipulations of the Abrahamic covenant, what that all means. And so we're going to walk through this and we'll be in this chapter for a little bit of time um, for some sessions. We're going to walk our way through it because it does take a little bit of time to get there. But let me do this. I want to read just the first six verses. Um, really, the chapter is a complete section uh, by itself, but I want it's, it's broken up into various sections. I just want to start with reading the first six verses uh, for us. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Well, then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, <clears throat> Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abram has just been through an interesting ordeal. From, from the practical perspective, he had been through the situation of the battle between the four kings of Kedarlaomer against the five kings of the Jordan Valley. And, and as we have seen, God blessed Abram with the with the victory over the battle. What God does in that story, when you take a look at the whole thing, is that he's raising Abram up into the eyes of the people. It's, it's as though God is saying, my stamp of approval and my sovereign decree is upon Abram. You're seeing God's sovereign choice here. That's what you're seeing. But Abram had gone through that and even other things in his life. And it, even though the text says sometime later, that means it's after the battle, after meeting the king of Sodom, Bera, and after meeting Melchizedek and having all of those events take place in his life. We don't know how much longer it is. We don't know how many days or months, maybe 
Uh, it had been a year. We don't know uh, from the time of the completion of chapter 14 to the beginning of chapter 15. That's, um, it's not for us to know. But you have, to, you have to think that at some point, Abraham could be possibly dealing with some maybe either fear or emotional disappointment. And you may would ask, why? I mean, look, he won the battle. God's stamp of approvals upon him. He's blessed by Melchizedek, who comes out from nowhere, the king of Salem and the priest of the Most High God, and here is someone he didn't expect to see who comes and blesses him and blesses the God of uh, blesses his God, the true God of heaven, and it helps Abram realize that God is working in this world way beyond what I could even imagine or think. There's something big going on. But it could be that from an emotional level, there could be some disappointment or some fear. Maybe he's thinking he had a close call. You know, he's... What Abram realizes is that, <laughs> you know, he, was, he could have been almost killed in the attack of, against that invading army. You wouldn't think it when he just, he knows what to do, right? In chapter 14, he knows to go and get his men together and go save Lot. I mean, he's motivated. Maybe he could be thinking that these kings are going to retaliate against him. They're going to come against him, against his family. Maybe they'll come out and do the battle again. Maybe they'll rethink this deal and realize that maybe this battle's not over. He could have been wondering, what, I wonder what the king of Sodom is thinking. It didn't, seem, it didn't seem like I pleased him too much. I didn't give him the honor. I didn't accept the honor that he gave me. There's no way I was going to do that. And maybe he's thinking, I, I didn't take any of the spoils of the war that he offered to me. It's like I refused. And coming from the king of Sodom's perspective, a wicked perspective. Abram knows the land is wicked. Abram knows. He sees it all around him. He's not, that's not hidden from him. So whatever's going on emotionally with Abram, there seems to be something that he's fearing or maybe emotionally distraught by. Maybe as some time later passes, he's, he's just wondering, how is this going to take place? How is God's promises going to take place in my life? How is this going to happen? How is this going to occur? How is God going to continue to work in my life? He's getting older. There's no children, no child to inherit the promised land. And it could be that all of these these things are emotionally taking a strain on him. Constant battles, strained relationships, just uncertainties about the future. So whatever's happening, Abram's soul was gripped by fear, some kind of disappointment. <clears throat> and so what God does is he comes and visits Abram and he speaks with him and he gives him reassurance of all these promises that God had made back in chapter 12 that he had reiterated uh, and again later in chapter 12, chapter 13, that the blessing had been given to him by Melchizedek, chapter 14. It's, it's all of this is adding up where God is saying, listen, let me give you my perspective. Let me help you here. Let me, this is God providing Abram comfort and peace, assurance about the future. That's what this chapter becomes. And yes, you're going to see God make a covenant with Abram. But the foundation of even why that covenant is made is to provide 
Abram assurance that God is in charge, that God is sovereign in this world, that God is going to make the things happen and fulfill every single promise that he has made. It's all going to happen. There's no way to stop this. There's no way to change this. This is going to take place. In Abram, God is going to work in his heart, even though Abram's not a perfect man, even though Abram <clears throat> has, ha, ha, still lives in an imperfect world, still lives in a sinful world at this point. I mean, he's, he's, but his heart is right, as we will see. God is working in his midst. And God comes down to speak to him, to reveal to him what he needs to know and what he needs to realize about who the God he serves is like. It's a very powerful chapter, a very interesting um, account that's given here. It's really like a dialogue between God and Abram. And, and they become the two main characters in the story. Nobody else is there. It says here, sometime later, this would be after the battle, after the meeting with the king of Sodom, <clears throat> after meeting King Melchizedek. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. He speaks to Abram in a vision. God speaks directly to Abram. The Lord is the covenant name of God. And when it says the Lord spoke to Abram, it's literally the Lord came and gave the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Abram is the idea, is the literal translation of this. And that's the first time you hear that phrase, the word of the Lord, mentioned in Scripture. And that's a formula that's um, it's kind of uncommon in the first six books of the Hebrew Scriptures, but it's quite common everywhere else. So that's, a, that's it's the Lord coming to visit Abram, and he comes in a vision. I'll explain that in a minute. But he's coming to to tell Abram to give him revelation, to give him understanding, to give him knowledge. In the book of Genesis, that phrase shows up just twice, and it's in this chapter, uh, ch verse 1 and then also verse 4, when it says, the Lord said to him. Again, the word of the Lord comes to him. It's God revealing himself to Abram is the idea. A phrase that we would be very common to understand and very easy to understand, or we, we're very familiar with it. But it's, that phrase is, is, is used frequently of, of prophetic revelation, like God appearing to a prophet. And so God is showing up to Abram. And it says he shows up in a vision. He shows up in a vision. A vision is not a dream. So Abram is awake. He's got the use of all of his faculties, okay? He's not asleep. So God would visit people in visions. God would visit people in dreams. So that was one, two of the major ways that God would visit and, and reveal himself. You can find that Solomon is asleep and, and, he's, and God visits him in a dream. Uh, Matthew, God visits him in a dream. And, and so there are times when God would reveal himself like that. They would be sleeping. Visions are the person's awake. So this would be like the, the, the text of Isaiah. We've been studying Isaiah, right? The book of Isaiah is the other, one of the other book studies in our, on our channel. And, and God reveals to him in a vision. So here, Abram's awake, and God comes to him. God's going to speak to him. God's going to reveal himself to him. And what is he going to do? What God is going to do, and this is what Abram needs, and this becomes the structure of the chapter. 
Abram needs to not fear the future. Abram needs to have full confidence in God. He has gone through a battle. He's gone through situations. And even though he may not know, may not know what's going to happen tomorrow, he may not know the script for tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the next year and the rest of his life, God is the Alpha and the Omega. God knows the beginning to the end, but Abram does not. And what Abram needs in this time in his life, he needs comfort. He needs assurance that God is on his throne. I mean, there are times when you and I need that. And this is a time in Abram's life where he needs that. And what God is going to do is that he's going to come to Abram and speak to him, reveal himself to him, because Abram needs to see three different aspects of God. Three different truths and realities about God. That's what he needs. And that's what the text presents us with. He needs to fully trust in who God is. And the way this works is he's going to have to fully trust in the character of God. He's going to have to fully trust in the plan of God. And he's going to have to fully trust in the power of God. He needs to fully trust in God's character, God's plan, and God's power. That's how this works. That's how this goes. And the character of God is in chapter 15, verse 1. The plan of God is verse 2 through 6. And the power of God is the majority of the chapter, verse 7, all the way down to verse 21. So these are the three aspects of God that he needs to fully trust in. And God's going to come to him and reveal to him about all three of these. God's going to reveal about his character, reveal about his plan, and reveal about his power. And when you and when Abram and even us, when we understand who our God is, how powerful he is, who who he what is his nature, what's his plan, what what what's the agenda that he has and and he has the power to make that agenda come to life and to take place. When you see that, when you know that, then you have, you have encouragement, you have direction, you can have faith, and you can fully trust in who God is. That is the, the beautiful thing here that God is going to do for Abram. And so what I want to do is go through the first aspect here, the character of God the character of God, and I want you to see what God says. We're just going to look at verse 1, and then as we continue in other sessions, we're going to just systematically work through the chapter (coughs) and walk through the other two aspects of who God is that Abram needs to trust in. This should give him foundation, peace, security, give him stability in his life because He's had some events. God has brought events into his life, and he's still got more years to live, by the way. He's not dying anytime soon. And and so he's got more years to live and more things to take place and more things to happen in his life. And so God's not done with him. But here is, is Abram needing that security, and God comes to him. So God speaks to him in a vision, and here's the first statement that God makes. Now, this will become God making a statement, Abram replying, God making a statement, Abram replying. There will be a conversation that takes place here, but it starts with the opening statement by God to Abram. And in this statement, you see the character of God. God is revealing to Abram who he is. He says, do not be afraid, Abram. Do not be afraid. You see, that's like that, that's where this all begins. Don't be afraid because I will protect you and your reward will be great. You see the encouragement here? You see the 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 words that that God has given to Abram to, as he reveals himself to him? You see the encouragement here? You see what's happening? 
In a sense, we this is the first time we find this great type of encouragement in the Bible. Abram, you're not going to find uh, encouragement in people, governments, other clans. People are going to fail you. People are weak. People are sinful. Just look at the history, Abram. But he opens up with the, the exhortation, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You can trust in me only and me fully. Don't be afraid, Abram. Only God can truly remove the great fears of this life. Safety and security, sickness and even death. Jesus would tell his disciples, don't fear those who can just kill the body. Feel the, fear the one who really can kill the body and the soul in hell. Fear God who has ultimate power. Mankind is weak. They're limited. They may claim to have a lot of power. They may claim to have a lot of influence. They may claim that the world revolves around them. But in essence, they do not. Jesus would tell Pilate, the only power you have is that which has been given to you by a, from above. And that's just true. Pilate didn't understand that. Pilate didn't realize that. Pilate would probably even deny that and think Jesus is, you know, in his mind, not worthy of death, but just a crazy man. But the reality is true. God is sovereign. God is Lord. Remember Abram had his previous journey into Egypt and had to be rebuked for it? And he came back out of Egypt. He doesn't want to relive that one. But God starts here by saying, do not be afraid. There is no need for you to fear anything. You don't fear man. You don't fear circumstances. Nothing that you need to fear in this world. Not one thing. Not one thing. Trust in me. Trust in the Lord. Trust in his truth. Trust in his word. There is no you have no reason to fear anything. Uh, just a few passages. Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah 35, um, verse 3 and 4. He says, with this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. Why? Because your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. Here is the sovereignty of God. This is God coming and be strong and do not fear. So strength and fear are the opposites of each other. Be strong in the truth of God. Be strong in the character of God. Be strong in who God is. Trust in Him for everything. You go to chapter 41 of Isaiah. Chapter 41, verse 10. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. We could look at chapter 43, uh, verse 1 and 2. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says this, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by, my, my, by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. 
When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Wow. Go to Isaiah 44, Isaiah 51, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And there's many other passages. Don't be afraid. And why specifically does he command Abram and exhort Abram not to be afraid? That he has no reason to fear. Because here's where he really gets into describing his character. He, he describes two aspects of it, uh, of his character. I will protect you and your reward will be great. I will protect you. I am your shield, which is, you see a lot in the, in the Psalms. You see a lot in the scriptures. A shield, literally that's what he's saying. I will protect you. I'm your shield. A shield would protect and defend a person. A shield has been used to, to provide protection, to defend themselves as from in battle. <laughs> Abram had just gone through a battle. So he's using the imageries of war here. He's saying, I'm your shield. They were a part of the soldier's army. They could be small shields, large shields, and you would hold them in one hand and the sword in the other. So if you're right-handed, you had your sword here and you'd put the shield and put it around your left hand and that would be to, to guard, to protect. Everyone knew what a shield was. And the large shields were large enough for soldiers to squat behind. So if you had these big shields, you could squat behind it and, and in a sense, protect your whole body. Um, if you go to the, the imagery of the armor uh, of God in spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 6, you, you have the sword of the Spirit. And then you have the shield, I think it's the shield of faith. And so shields were made of animal skins, could be made of wood or some kind of metal. They were made to be strong. They were made all shapes and forms. Some were square, round, oval, oblong, but their primary purpose was to defend. And so God is telling Abram, I am your shield. I am the one who will protect you. I am the one who will defend you. When you do what I tell you to do, and when you are living this life, I am with you. I am here to protect you. And what God did was he shielded Abraham does that mean Abraham wouldn't have trials, wouldn't have situations to go through? No. But even Job, who went through a great trial and God allowed suffering in his life, he's still Job's protector. He is still sovereign on the throne. Job's suffering did not happen outside of the sovereignty of God. And so you may not know what the script is for tomorrow. You may not know what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day or the next year. But it's not for us to know. We are to live it. We live each day. Jesus says, just focus on each day. And the truth, the, one of the great truths that you need to remind yourself of constantly is that the Lord is our shield. He shielded Abram. He shielded him from being hopelessly discouraged or giving up. Don't deny the faith. Don't deny the promises that I have made to you. These promises are going to take place because what's really dealing with Abram, what he's really concerned about, he's going to, he's going to, when he replies in verse 2, it's, it's, it's going to be the issue of his Who's going to inherit? Who's going to, who's going to pass on the lineage? Who am I going to give birth to? You say it's, there's going to be a seed um, that, that I'm going to have descendants and from my own loins, and I don't even have a child, and I'm getting older, and my wife's getting older. That's what's really going on in his head. And, and he's saying, listen, I'm going to protect you. I want to protect you from being defeated by the enemies of life from losing your soul to the spiritual enemies of God, from losing your heart in the face of weakness or temptation or trial. 
I mean, you can go to Psalm 3, Psalm 18, Psalm 30, th Psalm 33, Psalm 84, Psalm 115, and, and there's all these passages that talk about how God will protect. Interestingly, the word protect is from the same verbal root of a word that was used by Melchizedek in chapter 14, verse 20, when he says, and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Melchizedek tells Abram, basically, God has shielded you from your enemies. This is how God has defeated your enemies for you. He has literally protected you from your enemies. This army is not going to come back to haunt you. This army is not going to come back and do anything. God has dealt with them by using you in the process. You have no reason to fear. <coughs> no reason to be afraid because God will protect you. The second aspect here of God's character and your reward will be great. Your reward will be great. I Literally, I am your reward. I am your the one who makes provision, supply, gives you your source of need. I am your source of need. Abram chose not to take any of the spoils of the war, right? From, from King Bera. He's like, no, no, no. There's a reason. I solemnly swear to the Lord God Most High, I will not take as much as a single thread or a sandal throng from what belongs to you. Because if I do, you will say this, I am the one who made Abram rich. And I'm not going to have that. King Bera, you are not my supply of need. You're not my source of need. I follow what I call God's economy. God's economy is that God will supply. And God will use whatever means he deems necessary to supply me with the, with the resources that I need to do that which he has called me to do. But I will not, and I know he's not, going to supply my need by following wicked means. God's economy is not the ends justify the means, no. It means I trust in God for my need, for that God will supply my need in the way that he chooses to do it in the righteous way. God will provide my needs for me through the job that I have, through the work that he's given me, the ability to do whatever means it is that God decrees. God will decree the means by which he decree, supplies the need. God could have chosen to have King Bera bless Abram, but he did not. He had Melchizedek do that. And Melchizedek brings Abram bread and wine to give to him, and Abram gladly receives it. Why? Because it was the proper means by which God supplies. So he's saying, listen, Abram, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be your shield, and I am your reward. You know, Abram never owned land not even really a small plot. And he could be asking the question, am I ever going to possess this land? Would I even have a son? And God is using the word reward. That which is given by God. Technically saying, Abram. He uses the, a, a, an interesting word there. When he says reward, and your reward will be great. Literally, I am your reward. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, I am, in my grace, I own it all. I am the one who owns it all. God is the one who is the owner of this earth, and he gives it to whom he chooses. When he chooses, 
how he chooses, whatever the means necessary that God has prescribed. God is in charge of the script. He's, in tr- he's sovereign. That's the whole point of this. You don't have to be afraid. If you know God and you know him, you understand that he is the Lord of the universe. He is the God of all gods. He's above everyone and everything. And he says, I will be your reward. And that reward will be great. Large quantity here, a very much increase in what is needed. I like what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously in this world. And He will give you, God the Father will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Just focus on today. Focus on what happens today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't try to plan it all out. Don't try to control it all. Because if you do, you know what happens if you do? Paul mentions this in Philippians, in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse. He says, verse 6, don't worry about anything. See, when you try to control, it creates worry. Um, Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all that He has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we could ever understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And so Paul gives an example of all of this. He says, verse 19, same chapter, in this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which has have been given to us in Christ Jesus. He's telling Abram, you have nothing to worry about. This is the character of God. He's your protector. He's your shield, and He is the one that provides everything you need. He's going to set your path. He's going to lead and guide. He is going to direct the steps. You may not understand it all, Proverbs 20, 24. You may not understand everything, but He's going to lead and guide and direct, and He's going to provide the needs that you that which you need, he knows. He knows it before you even say it. He knows you, he knows you have the need even before you ask it. And so just depend upon him, trust in him, have faith in him. Don't fear. Fear is will debilitate faith. Fear debilitates trust. And so to alleviate the fear, trust in the character of God. And that's why it's important we understand God's word, we read God's word, we follow God's word because we need to understand who our God is. So that's the first area that that Abram needs to trust in, the character of God. But God also has a plan for Abram. And God's going to communicate that plan. And Abram must trust in that plan. And we'll begin to look at that next time. Dear Lord, we do thank you again for this time to look at your word, to look at your truth. Lord, you are sovereign, you are Lord, and we have no need or no reason to fear anything. We can live confidently in you, confidently in your truth, confidently in your word. Lord, may you receive all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in chapter 15 now. And it's a wonderful chapter. Very important that we systematically go through this and understand this. So uh, tell those about the series. Tell those about the study in Genesis. And uh, may the Lord bless you today. And we'll see you next time.